Good afternoon. Welcome to Canada Business Live. I'm Travis Copenhaver. I'm joined today with Nick Melendez. Hey. Uh, we have a couple, uh, well, one big news article to kind of really cover today for the first half of our show, uh, going over the outcome um, from the Court of Claims regarding temporary operators, uh, Laura's reaction to that outcome and what we can expect over the next few weeks for temporary operators, patients, caregivers, etc. cetera. Uh, we're gonna start the first half of our show going through that case and what we can expect. Uh, and depending on how much time we have left, we're also going to be touching on a lot of intellectual property topics uh, that are gonna affect cannabis licenses. So let's get right into it, Nick. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the temporary outcome or that well, it is a temporary outcome, the temporary operator outcome in Green Genie at all versus state of Michigan. Mm. Um, so what exactly happened? So as you kind of uh, have been keeping up on the temporary operator saga uh, continues and uh, yesterday we kind of received uh, somewhat of a temporary but more concrete resolution on the issue. Uh, temporary operators basically, you know, just to make a long story short, if you satisfied certain criteria, local approval, submit an application by a certain date, you would be allowed to remain open while your application was pending. Um, there were deadlines established that kept moving and eventually this is what ended up uh, creating the lawsuit that was heard by the Court of Claims. Uh, a few of the temporary operator applicants had uh, sued the state and Lara, uh, arguing that this process and the um, deadlines and the different criteria that kept moving uh, violated certain due process rights that they had. Um, and eventually, you know, going back and forth, we ended up hearing, uh, I know Judge Borello of the Court of Claims heard the case um, a few weeks ago, I believe, and had expected to have his ruling by last Friday. Uh, got but pushed it ended back up, a few times. Yeah. yeah, and so it ended up coming uh, Tuesday. this Tuesday. Yep. So on uh, April 30th, uh, we did get an opinion and order which effectively ruled that these temporary operators had the right to uh, remain open as they both had their applications continue to be pending as well as appeal any potential denial that they received. Um, it was quite the opinion, uh, I think the obvious and most direct impact that had is it, anyone that has that temporary operating status gets to continue open until they exhaust their appeal options. Um, but there's some other interesting outcomes of that as well. Um, so first, like, what, how did we get to the conclusion? Like, what, what did the judge basically determine as the reason that they could exercise these appeal rights? Right. So what basically happened was that the, uh, the applicants argued that these decisions, as I mentioned, violated due process. And so, you know, without getting too legalese on everyone, there's uh, language in the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution that says the state can't deprive you of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And there's two different types, but basically they were saying is that, you know, these decisions were arbitrary. We had a protected interest in this property right or this benefit that the state was offering to us. And uh, these decisions that were made and how we were treated offended those notions of fairness and full opportunity to be heard and, you know, only getting that denial after you've had a full opportunity to have your case or your application heard. Right. Um, so basically, that's how we got here. Um, and again, the um, ever-changing shutdown dates. And I think that the way that uh, the argument was the way that Lara was reviewing the applications and the time it was taking them to do that uh, kind of all added together to make this, uh, you know, an argument related to due process. And so, so, and I think that's, that's the main takeaway from uh, the conclusion the court arrived to. Um, while the direct impact is for those temporary operators, those few businesses that are still appealing those denials or are still waiting for the application to be heard, uh, it, it also sets a really good standard for applications in general. Uh, you know, there was a, a section of the statute from the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act that basically says, you know, this isn't a property right. You, you have no, you know, interest in or, or protection for this license if you attain it. Uh, and the judge basically threw that out. He said, you know, you receive a benefit. This is a property interest, which means you have a due property protection for, you know, making sure that your interests are protected should you obtain it. Um, and I think that that logic is going to be something that we can utilize in a lot of situations moving forward for any type of license holder. Um, you know, a lot of, not only the, the state law had that right in there, but most municipalities will put into their ordinance that, you know, if we issue you a license, we have the right to take it away. Uh, or it's, you know, you have no ability to, to treat this as like a non-conforming use or uh, some other uh, appealable due process protected approval that you get from them. And, um, you know, the judge basically is like, well, that's incorrect. 
uh, you clearly get a benefit and that benefit is determined to be a property interest. Mm -hmm. and, and while it's not going to immediately throw out any of the language in any of those ordinances or other laws, uh, it's the, the legal logic that, that the judge concluded that we can basically use you know, as the foundation of challenging other laws in the future should we need to. Mm -hmm. You know, if a municipality gives you a license or a permit to operate and, and you do nothing to violate the rules or they change the rules on you to make it impossible for you to maintain that license, you know, you have a great argument put together by the Court of Claims that you can use to, you know, basically start your appeal of that mm -hmm. issue. Right. So, you know, yeah. the long-term implications of this conclusion, I think, are going to be more useful for the industry overall, but the obvious short-term implications are very, you know, interesting as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think that was the biggest thing that, uh, you know, the state was arguing these plaintiffs, these temporary operator applicants don't have an argument. They can't even bring this case in court. The reason for their argument was that that section that said this license is not a property right. Um, if they didn't have a property right, it couldn't have been violated. Uh, their due process rights couldn't have been violated since, you know, life, liberty, or property, if you don't have a property right, then by way of reasoning, that can't be violated. Um, what Judge Borello said was that, you know, even though that section of the law said you don't have a property right, uh, it passes the smell test or the sight test, you know, you know it when you'll see it. Uh, there were rules, requirements, notice, hearing, appeals, all of those things were kind of wrapped into one, uh, despite the fact that it said no property right. So even though it's labeled as not a property right, the court concluded very reasonably that it is. Right. And so uh, that's just another kind of sentiment where you know it can say one thing, but really when you look at it, you know it's not just how it's labeled; it's what it really means, what it stands for in reality, in practice. Right. So uh, the opinion and order came out on Tuesday. On Thursday, uh, the medical, the marijuana regulatory agency or LARA uh, came out with a response. You know, basically saying that they're going to be reviewing the affected applications with great haste, um, swiftly providing you know approvals and denials, and, and ensuring that those appeals you know move forward you know as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know we we want to state you know cannabis legal group you know. Regardless of the situation, you know, uh, overall, the MRA, a marijuana regulatory agency, you know, the, the agency that has been four names at this point, um, you know, they, their job is to, you know, implement the law as they determine it. So, you know, their, their outcome is what it is. And, and, and they're handling with grace the, you know, the path forward here. Uh, there's some other things kind of coming down the line that might impact temporary operators again. What are, what are some of these bill, pending bills in the legislature? Now? Right, yeah, so okay, before we go there, just one thing I wanted to mention too sure. about the MMFLA license. So not only did the judge conclude that an actual MMFLA license is a property interest, but also the provisional licenses that the temporary operators were right. operating under were found to be a license type. And there's, you know, Administrative Procedures Act that says Right. If you have a use and it's a new application, you can't just deprive it without a full and final right. opportunity so, to do that. So, so for those of us non-attorneys, that's why I didn't go there. So, sure. so the temporary operator is technically operating under a provisional license, not the type of license a fully licensed business is going to have. Either either license has the property interest the judge is describing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. so he extended it enough to allow him to right. conclude that way in favor of temporary operators that it wasn't arbitrary and capricious random decision uh, according to the court that offended those notions of fairness and, and due process. Exactly. Uh, to go back to Travis's question about the uh, kind of bills that are pending is a uh, House Bill 4440. Uh, it was passed by the House. Uh, to my knowledge now, it is in the Senate. Um, that can also come into play uh, along with Lara's uh, advisory bulletin that they will be swiftly deciding the applications. But what this potential new law will do uh, in addition to, uh, we've reported on this before, but it's, uh, you know, it prohibits you from applying for one year if you hold yourself out as a licensed facility. Well, let's stop on that and explain what that means first. So, so if you are acting as a business that would need to hold a license um, and you get caught doing that, then you are prohibited from applying for the actual license for one year. Right. Right. Yeah. So in addition to doing that, um, basically they kind of did a carve out for, for temporary operating facilities saying right. that you know, the board or the agency can't hold out, you know, hold it against them if they continue to temporarily operate. Uh, part of the judge's holding was that um, there's an injunction, basically the state and Lara are prohibited from enforcing or shutting down these temporary operators or facilities that arguably, you know, are not having a license uh, until 60 days after a final agency decision. Uh, now, what that means is that 
not only, you know, now Lara is going to be reviewing these applications and, and issuing decisions, uh, you still have an opportunity to appeal that and have a public investigative hearing with an administrative law judge. And so basically what the judge's ruling was is that after that administrative law judge uh, then has to send it to Lara and Lara has to issue its final decision whether or not it was right. Uh, after that decision and you, it gets mailed out, 60 days after that is when that temporary operator would have to shut down. So there's kind of a timeline and a timetable for how this is all supposed to play out thanks to the judge's ruling. Um, it's kind of more clear now going forward, uh, you know, to ensure due process is, is respected, uh, this is now kind of the way that the process is going to go forward with temporary operators. Exactly. So we continue to talk about temporary operators and, um, you know, I'm certain that we will have more to say on it as this all rolls out. And I think I say this every show I'm on where there are temporary operators, there's, there's less and less and less of them as they exhaust their appeals or get their approvals. So. Um, while it's very newsworthy and a lot of other people are reporting on it, just remember the, the pool of who is a temporary operator cannot continue to expand. It's, you had to have been in the system since what, February? February 15th, 2018. February, February 2018. By so so the, the, the amount of businesses that did that and are still temporary operating will only continue to go down. Um, what also was confirmed on Thursday through part and parcel with the same response is, is what's going to be the case now because we've reached the deadline of caregivers being able to provide product directly to uh, provisioning centers. So what's the new rule now, Nick? Um, not new. I guess they could have done this too. But. Yeah. So there was a second court case that kind of got swept under the rug because there was the main one that Travis and I talked about at length. Uh, there was kind of another one arguing a little bit about caregiver products and testing. Um, both of the opinions touched on it a little bit, but basically uh, in Lars bulletin discussing caregiver products, um, they're not going to take disciplinary action against the licensee uh, continued based on that March 21st resolution. So, uh, you know, for licensed provisioning centers, they can only get that from licensed growers and processors. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the licensed growers and processors can still, at least for now, continue to get that product from caregivers as long as it's entered into metric immediately, right. tested, and then can be sent to a licensed provisioning center. All right, and there has been a bit of confusion about, okay, well, what if I'm a caregiver with extracted products or, or marijuana-infused products? Um, the way it reads is a grower can receive products. So uh, as, as I would interpret the, the plain language demonstrated, and as we've, I've heard from a few growers that we work with, you know, if you are taking advantage of this and you hold a grower license, then a caregiver can not only sell you, you know, flour, but also potentially other products that it's made as well. Just either the processor or the grower coming into possession of those products has a duty to enter them into metric and have them tested. And from there, they pass the test, they move forward, they don't pass the test, we treat it like any other product that doesn't. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that plays out, um, but there is still a, a period of time where the patient caregiver system can continue to prop up the license system until enough licenses kind of stabilize the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll continue to you know, keep track of how that's going as well. So uh, we wanted to spend the first half of our show really going through uh, the court case and temporary operators because obviously that's been the biggest news this week. Um, but before that was going to be coming out, we wanted to spend a bit of time talking about intellectual property issues and how they affect uh, cannabis businesses. You know, back in March 21st, we got an advisory bulletin from Lara basically confirming that you can enter into brand and licensing deals with companies. Uh, clarifying the types of relationships you can have as you build out a product line and brand these products. And we wanted to kind of briefly go over some of the basics of intellectual property and how they kind of have an impact on the cannabis industry and then talk about some of the intellectual property like licensing deals and, and white labeling agreements uh, that these businesses are going to be kind of contemplating over the next few months. Mm -hmm. so, so kind of to start, um, let's just go over what intellectual property is so we all are kind of on the same playing field. Right. So what's, a, what's intellectual property? Right. Right? And so similar to uh, what Jennifer and I had talked about last week with piercing the corporate veil and what a you know, company is, what an LLC is, what a corporation is, these are all kind of, I don't want to say fake, they are things that are not tangible. They are intangible goods, mm -hmm. uh, intellectual property that we have as a society uh, in certain, you know, different jurisdictions, different countries have different rules about how intellectual property is protected. But basically, um, it kind of can break down into, you know, three or maybe four different types of categories. Right. The, you know, the trademarks, three big ones. Yeah. copyrights, patents, trade secrets are a little bit of a different beast. But yeah. basically, these are all things that we 
uh, protect and we acknowledge that they have value and we want to set up and incentivize people to be able to create them, protect them, um, you know, profit off of them and incentivize creation and, you know, original works of art and, and innovation and inventions. And yeah. so, so, so I like to think of IP as, as the three big categories. We got inventions, we got plagiarism, and we got brands, right? So a patent is, is basically the protection you put in place for the creator of a, a unique idea invention uh, process, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if you develop a, a piece of equipment that does something no other piece of equipment's done before, you could potentially get a patent on it. it and there's other types of patents as well. Um, there are lots of businesses and, and people pursuing cannabis-related patents. Uh, there's, there's agricultural plant type patents as well as you know, utility and design type patents. Uh, we're not gonna get into it too much, but you know, the, the, basically if you have invented something, invented a process or uh, invented some sort of genetics and things like that, there's opportunity to protect the novelty of that invention. Um, the ones that are much more obvious to cannabis businesses, in the most part, unless you're in the you know, manufacturing kind of service touching area of cannabis, are copyrights and trademarks. Mm -hmm. um, copyrights are effectively uh, your protections from plagiarism. It's, it's a, an image, a set of words, a design, and, and it protects your authorship of that image, design, or work. Um, if I write a book and somebody cuts and pastes their, my work into theirs and treats it as their own, like they, their plagiarism, um, the copyright concept is what's protecting me. So if I design a piece of artwork and somebody steals that artwork and puts it on their website or puts it you know, in, in some source that they use, it's the copyright protection that's preventing them from doing that. Um, and we're gonna bruise through copyright too because while copyrights and patents clearly have a big impact on, on business interests, um, the real, uh, real source of you know business development is in brand development and that's where trademarks really do a huge huge lift mm -hmm. uh, trademarks are this an, an, a mark what we call a marker a, a sound image uh, set of words that indicate the source of a good or service uh, it is the goodwill of your company so if you think about a logo or uh, the name of a company or a slogan and you immediately think, okay, here's what that business is and here's what they're selling me. That's what your trademark is. My, fam my favorite example is Nike. You hear the word Nike and you think tennis shoes and apparel. Uh, you and, see, and the check. And the check. Right. You see the swoosh, you see just the image alone, you think Nike, tennis shoes, apparel, sports, right? Mm -hmm. And you hear a slogan such as, let's say, just do it, and you think Nike, and you think tennis shoes, apparel, sports, etc. Those are three trademarks that the company Nike has developed. The name Nike, the imagery they use to associate with their products, and then the slogans and advertising phrases and, and et cetera that also are used. You know, if you think of any famous brand, you know, McDonald's, if I say just do it, you're gonna think, okay, Big Macs and cheeseburgers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's millions of them. You think Apple computers and phones and laptops. Um, so. Right, and, and you get more protection the more distinctive and the more unique your mark is. Uh, also, you know, for those marks that aren't as extravagant or aren't as discernible, you can get a secondary meaning after you yep. know, use in trade and consumers attaching a secondary meaning to that. And exactly. you know, so. when we're talking about trademarks and copyrights and patents, uh, there are different protections based on federal law and state law, which obviously yep. with cannabis can create issues uh, with it being a Schedule One controlled substance still. Uh, but definitely, you know, there's it's important to parse the differences out because, you know, sometimes you, you'll hear people saying, oh, yeah, that's that's a great logo. Let me patent it. Or, yep. you know, it, it may, it's really important to use the right nomenclature and, and make sure that you're not wanting to actually copyright something instead of trademark it and, and vice versa because there's different protections there's different reasons for actually exactly having those done uh, so you definitely want to you know at least know the lingo or be able to make sure you're asking for the right thing and obviously with uh, you know attorneys assisting you uh, could definitely get you, point you in the right direction with that exactly um, so let's let's t let's focus in on the types of businesses we talk about on this show we talk about growers processors, secure transporters, safety compliance facilities, and provisioning centers or dispensaries. So the, the three big ones obviously are our grower processors and then our provisioning centers. So we have wholesalers of cannabis products, you know, flour, edibles, vape cartridges, everything, all the actual products. And we have a service provider, a retail store that sells a certain type of line of products 
to a consumer. In the case of a provisioning center, they sell medical marijuana products to medical marijuana patients, but pay customers walk into that store, buy products, and leave. So our provisioning centers are providing a service to the patients, namely a retail service, and processors, provisioning centers are providing you know, products directly. There's, you know, if you buy a brand of cannabis product, it is wholesaled by either a grower or a processor, and your point of sale would be your provisioning center. Um, and just like any other business that either has products or services, there's going to be a whole slew of identifying, you know, brand indicating items and marks. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to use uh, an example just kind of so we have something to point to. So Nick has a picture of yeah, so a logo uh, here. this was a uh, logo that was recently created from one of my buddies from high school, Matt. Uh, thank you for letting us use this logo on our show. Uh, but just kind of pose this, uh, and I know we're going to put it up on the screen for a second. But uh, Travis, if you want to kind of go through, you know, can this be copyrighted? Can this right. be trademarked? What are the kind of differences between both of them? Sure. So and... yeah, I'll have Nick hold it up if when we when we talk sure. about it here. Um, okay. So where would you imagine seeing something like this in the cannabis industry, right? Mm. Let's start there. So first of all, uh, it's a it's a piece of artwork. It is a unique design that an artist created, right? Mm. So probably that, work for hire. Oh, it, well, we could get into the details of who owns the copyright. Sure. But just conceptually, uh, assuming that that wasn't cut and paste or taken from some other artist, an artist created this image, mm. uh, namely your buddy. So. Uh, from copyright protections alone, you know, if some other person attempts to claim that they were the author of this work, then there would be a copyright protection that you can, you know, use to prevent that from occurring, and you can formalize, you know, those types of protections through a registration. Um, because uh, copyrights are about authorship and not about content, there aren't a lot of restrictions on the type of copyright protections you can get. Because, you know, even though it says the word "reefer madness" on it. Uh, doesn't mean that you're necessarily using it to sell cannabis. You could, you know, be a, a, an apparel company in the field of trying to target products and services to cannabis enthusiasts or something mm -hmm. like that. So your authorship, you know, might be designed and used for cannabis directly, but that doesn't necessarily mean it would be. Um, so the copyright protection is pretty simple. Uh, from a trademark perspective, if you actually look at this image here, I'll sure, we'll look at it again. Um, you know, it becomes a trademark when it is put into a location that indicates that it is the source of a good or service. So if you imagine that the company uh, or a company is, is called Reefer Madness um, and it has, a, let's say, brownies, right? So if I went to a store and I wanted to buy brownies uh, from, the, from the company or wh whatever brand controls Reefer Madness, uh, you would expect to see this image on the packaging. Oh, this is a madness. Madness. It's madness. A, it's a oh, my bad. Play, was, I'm sorry, Matt. Matt. <laughs> so, so, you know, when you go into any store and you pick up a brownie, or, or, you know, whether it's cannabis or not, you're going to see a logo on it usually. You're going to see, you know, what it is and what, what I'm buying, but you're also going to see where it came from. So when an image like this is being used to identify the company or the, the source of where these products have made, you know, that's when the trademark protection start, or starts to kick in, mm -hmm. right? Um, but trademark doesn't have to be your logo, it can also be your name. You know, if you look at any t-shirt you buy, any piece of apparel, you go to the tag on your neckline and you see, okay, well, it was made by, you know, Adidas or Reebok or Nike or, you know, any store that you'd buy from. You know, what's on the front of your shirt might be blue with dots or, you know, red lines, but, you know, it was made by Brooks Brothers or, or, mm. or some apparel store. So the, the, the company itself is your source, and there's some sort of mark, word, or slogan indicating what that source is. Right, and I think that's where people get a little tied up because they'll want to just put it right here, but right. you know, especially in apparel, you do yeah. the hundreds of trademark consultations that you've done and suggested that it needs to be on the actual tag or the label right. that's attached to it or a price tag rather than putting that there. Now, you can put the copyrighted image, you know, again, yep. kind Nothing of says you couldn't kind of put some it synergy, there. Right. but to, to trademark it, it does need to be some kind of identifying source that does indicate where that goods, where the goods come from. And that being that on the front doesn't necessarily always indicate that um, as, you know, opposed to a tag or, or an actual, right. you know, so, so using reefer madness again as our example, let's imagine a, a processor is creating a marijuana infused product, right? So they're going to wholesale a batch of products and when they put that into the marked for individual sale packaging materials, he would utilize this logo or that company would utilize this logo, you know, putting it like front and center so that when someone's in that store and it's like, ooh, that looks good, uh, or like I've had reefer madness branded products before, 
um, you know, that's going to help the consumer identify like, you know, brand loyalty. If, if you have, if you are a customer or a consumer and, and you, and you develop some sort of trust or expectation in the quality or, or the, um, some other factor that, that is of interest to you as a consumer, you know, that's what your, your source mark is indicating. Um, so if some other company wanted to be, um, refer mad, mad, madness instead of madness, um, you know, that might cause confusion. And, and what a trademark protection is doing is, is helping the consumer identify where the products are coming from. So, you know, when you, are, when you determine what your trademarks are and the more that you use them, you start building up a protection from people who are trying to use something that we call an, a confusingly similar mark. So if I wanted to create an apparel company and I wanted to use a check mark that was maybe slightly different than Nike's, you know, the Nike company is probably going to have a problem with me putting check marks all over my apparel products because I'm going to be confusing some portion of the Nike purchasing consumer uh, where they're going to be buying my products in error thinking that they are truly purchasing Nike. So if someone wanted to use a mark similar to this, um, even though it was very similar but different, um, if it is too similar, then the company that created and developed the goodwill behind that mark is going to have some claims to prevent the second company from utilizing similar marks. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the ideal situation. You want to uh, develop your brand um, and, and marks that identify for your consumers what your brand is um, so that you create loyalty or what we consider goodwill. Uh, your reputation in the industry for quality or for um, affordability or uh, other factors that might you know, encourage consumers to buy your products. Um, and then you protect that so that someone can't you know, assume your shoes and pretend to be you to uh, you know, leech sales away from the products that those consumers actually wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. um, and because you know, we're talking cannabis, we'll, we'll try to look at this through the context of cannabis industries. So if I'm a dispensary, or a provisioning center or a marijuana retailer, depending on what license you're holding, um, you know, your brand indicating I, source is, is most directly probably going to be some sort of signage or uh, something on your brick and mortar store indicating like, yes, this is us. Here we are. Uh, you're also going to see stores advertised the same way that, um, you know, other industries are going to advertise, you know, maybe a website, um, ads, you know, potentially billboards, etc. Now, in the cannabis industry, there's restrictions on what those advertisements can be. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's there's that aspect of things. You can't make marks that appeal to children. Uh, you can't put your advertisements indicating your, um, you know, products and services in, in a location where children will frequent. So, you know, while there are things you can do, the regulations prevent you from doing certain things. Um, and then, you know, the type of business you're in is going to put you in different places. You know, wholesale retailer, uh, someone who just holds the grower license doesn't have a point of sale option. So, you know, you can't buy directly from the manufacturer. Uh, you would need to be able to find, you know, places to purchase these products. So, you know, a grower might say our products are being sold at these six dispensaries throughout the state of Michigan or something. So there's still advertisement you can do even when you're just a wholesaler. Um, and, and your methods you utilize, you know, let's say you come up with a fancy slogan or something to, to uniquely create a, a, a sense in your consumers to actually go buy your products is valuable to your company. And as you develop those, you want to prevent other companies from basically stealing them from you. Right. So the challenge with trademarks in cannabis is that traditionally the, the best trademark protection you can get is through a federal registration. Cannabis being federally illegal means that it has traditionally been prevented from obtaining federal registration directly for cannabis products and services, uh, which requires a bit more uh, creativity in trying to protect and develop cannabis brands. Um, so there are different ways to protect trademarks, and, and the most obvious and the most important is to just start using your brand. The more you create uh, uh, the idea that this is the product associated with your use and evidence that you are using those uh, brand identifying features, uh, the more you do that and where you do that, the greater geographic scope will create protections directly. Right, and they usually, you know, first use in commerce or if you're yep. planning on actually using one, you can go ahead and say, okay, here's that kind of template, here's when I plan on using it, and then what they'll do is ask you later on just to provide proof that you have been Correct. using that in commerce. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, when you were talking, I was thinking of a, you know interesting question is that, you know, you're saying these provisioning centers, dispensaries are providing a service. They're selling, you know, establishing the storefront and stocking products from other manufacturers. So 
you know, it seems to me that there's really no way for a product like theirs to be getting trademark protection necessarily because they're not selling a good, they're selling a service. And, I, and while we know there are service marks, I mm -hmm. um, think just kind of want to transition into our, you know, last topic of the right. day with white labeling, licensing, and pack packaging agreements. So Travis, if you can kind of go over, you know, a little bit of differences between those and how, you know, as a storefront, sure. you could potentially find a legal way uh, that works for both parties to be able to actually establish goods that are your own. I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, storefronts that we've seen have their own house brands. And so while that provisioning center can't create it on its own, if it doesn't have it grower or processor license, it can still it somehow finds a way to get its logo right. on that package to identify the source of the goods. Great, great transition because this is the whole reason we wanted to talk about this. So now that we kind of talk about what trademarks are, um, well, what can you do with them? Uh, first and foremost, you protect yourself from consumer competition that's unfair, but you can also basically license the ability to use uh, different marks for your business. So if I am just a provisioning center, but I have the desire to make an in-house brand uh, to sell out of my storefronts, um, there are ways that I can contractually uh, work with either a grower and or a processor to develop a line of products specifically for my store. Um, there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, you'll hear the phrase white labeling. You'll also just hear you know, trademark leasing or licensing uh, from one business to another. And those are, are kind of both happening depending on how you're setting this deal up. But imagine you're a grower and then you have, let's say 10% of your production set aside for, for this dispensary to create you know, a certain brand of brownies. I'll, I'll use brownies again, right? So, so we've contracted with uh, Reefer Madness to create Reefer Madness brownies. Now, that means the provisioning center doesn't necessarily have to own a grower's license, be financially connected to a grower's license, um, but they can work with one to specifically create a line of cannabis that is cultivated and then sent to a processor to be infused uh, into brownies and then packaged with my Reefer Madness mark to be sold at my Reefer Madness provisioning center. Um, and it was until just very recently a little up in the air about what types of contractual relationships we could truly establish. Um, Lara, uh, or the Marijuana Regulatory Agency, has clarified that intellectual property uh, can be licensed traditionally like it is in other uh, industries. Now, we still have uh, our constraints of licensure. You know, if your contractual obligations make you either directly or indirectly an owner of 10% or more, uh, you need to be vetted before you can do so. Um, if you have direct or indirect control over the decisions one company is making, um, then you might be, you know, have to go through the pre-qualification review as well. Uh, but if you don't cross the threshold of being considered indirectly either an owner or directly or indirectly controlling the grower, you can still have a traditional business relationship from with a manufacturer to create a brand of products specifically for your use. Whether that brand is uh, the same brand as your overall storefront or just a a, a product brand directly that you just have the exclusive right to sell doesn't really matter. You can, you know, financially and contractually set up an operation like that. And I think the biggest thing that came out of that uh, advisory bulletin was that royalties are okay. Mm -hmm. Royalties based on number of units sold. Um, and I'm sure people were calling and clarifying and, and trying to figure out what the department was allowing. Uh, but specifically to have it in writing in an advisory bulletin uh, definitely makes a lot of difference because uh, then you're not guessing, you're not trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Mm -hmm. um, what they did advise though is that if you do try to seek out this agreement, you do have to provide the department, or I guess the agency now, yep. <laughs> with the uh, copy of the contract, names of the individuals involved, uh, and you also have to update them as far as uh, when that changes, when it's going to be updated, you have to show them proof of that. So similar to with management agreements or with other types of things that the agency wants to know about beforehand or at, as things change, uh, just like this, you know, if you're using another company's intellectual property and have a contract with them, you pay them royalties and the department and agency just wants to see when, right. when those are different just to make sure it doesn't you know, start off innocent and then transform into a control type contract that should be vetted. Exactly. The other thing that we can very clearly do is, you know, while Michigan might be the newest adult use state and our marijuana, medical marijuana licensing 
is in its infancy, uh, there are large brands that have been operating in other states. Um, and if you wanted to, let's say, work with a large California or Colorado brand and have products that are under the umbrella of the types of products those companies are famous for producing in their states, you can, through intellectual property licensing, um, be the either what we call a white labeler or like a grower who grows products and then rebrands them as one of these companies' brands, or um, or just directly have a um, a licensing agreement where you are the manufacturer of one of those brands in Michigan, um, and and you can capture that with a uh, intellectual property licensing agreement based on royalties of units sold. Um, and it was a little up in the air about whether or not we could do that before this advisory bulletin, but this makes it fairly clear that we can. So, you know, if you are a wholesaler, you can potentially be entering into licensing and brand agreements with either in-state or out-of-state um, brands to create those products here. Um, or you could do, as we described before, uh, intrastate, work with our point of sale, or maybe work with processors uh, or, you know, any of those license sites truly could work together uh, to create a specific type of licensed product, um, trademark licensed product. Um, where you know the ownership of the product from point A to point B to point C doesn't necessarily need to be captured in a vertically integrated business, mm -hmm. right? A lot of businesses, as we talked about a lot on the show, want to own a grow license and own a provisioning center license so that they control their manufacturing and their point of sale. There's clearly a very powerful, you know, just uh, cost of goods. Um, you know, revenue potential for businesses capable of doing that, but you're not prevented from doing something similar to create certain types, you know, of products and, and service certain types of consumers. Mm -hmm. So as you're uh, deciding how you want to interact in this industry, um, you're not going to be prevented from engaging in the similar types of synergies you can as the other larger businesses are going to be able to. Um, and now we focus, you know, just for sake of really illustration uh, on growers, processors and provisioning centers uh, equally will be, you know, the brand potential for testing labs and secret transporters. You know, uh, it's going to be very important to the reputation of a safety compliance facility that builds up a reputation for being known as providing, you know, quality tests or, or quick turnarounds on, on their testing mm -hmm. results. Um, and as that company becomes known for uh, you know, or develops a, a powerful reputation, you know, if another new lab wanted to get itself set up and try to, you know, make a name so similar that it could prevent, in, you know, business to business confusion, trademark protection exists for a company like that as well. Similarly to secure transporters, you know, if a secure transporter is known for, you know, doing its deliveries quickly or affordably um, and develops a reputation uh, by and through its name and brand indicating devices and some other secure transporter uh, attempted to, you know, unfairly use a confusingly similar name. Um, you know, it's not just individual human consumer confusion, it's also business to business confusion as well. And should those businesses start to engage in such unfair practicing, that's when your trademark protections really kick in. Mm. Um, and I do want to chime in too, because there are, if you've been watching the licensing board meetings, a lot of similar names, green mm -hmm. this, pure that, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what we're talking about. And I right. think, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's taking me so long to think of a name. All the good names are taken. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, kind of step back a few and say that, you know, whatever your company name is, LLC, Inc, Corporation, that is not what we're talking about here. Right. The entity names that you have to register either through the state of Michigan or elsewhere are basically, there are an infinite amount of different types of uh, names that you could create. If McDonald's LLC was available in Michigan to register for, you could do that and McDonald's wouldn't come in and have any right. trademark claim, any copyright name. That is basically just kind of your you know, file for the state that allows you to be a business. Uh, these are different than you know what, what Travis is talking about and what I've been talking about this whole time is actual trademarks, actual copyrights, actual brands are different than what it says on your articles of organization, comma, LLC. Or your, or your assumed name, or exactly. Assumed name. So there uh, are differences here. So when you see all the greens and pures and all the different company names uh, getting approved and going through the process, uh, those can be confusingly similar. Those are just names that you right. can pick. The, the, the other, the other famous overlap that causes a lot of confusion would be a domain name. Like, okay, well, what if I'm um, 420.com? Like, what about all the other businesses with 420 or in their name? Well, your website address doesn't necessarily 
uh, have a one-to-one -one with the type of brand you're developing or vice versa. Uh, you know, you could, you know, in theory, have a domain name that's uh, reefermadness.com that has nothing to do with cannabis. And if some cannabis company in Michigan sets itself up and operates as a cannabis company, maybe some other completely unrelated business in Oklahoma is called Reefer Madness and owns reefermadness.com. Um, it's only when those websites are also in a similarly situated industry uh, when trademarks really start jumping in. You know, if, if I create, uh, I, I can't think of a good example. Well, for right, so, so if Reefer Madness was, uh, you know, beach low beach yeah. wear you know kind of board shorts right? hats exactly. sunglasses that wouldn't necessarily bump into the same cannabis kind of lane as the cannabis reefer madness exactly. that's selling products as a licensed company presumably and potentially in the future because trademarks are about confusion right mm -hmm. if if i have mcdonald's um i don't know uh fidget spinners, right? Yeah, chainsaws. No, or whatever, chainsaws, right? perfect, it's, motor oil. Mm -hmm. um, just because we're both using the word McDonald's doesn't mean that anyone's gonna confuse a chainsaw with the famous fast food restaurant. So, you know, when you're talking about what a trademark can protect you from, having a trademark for reefer madness doesn't mean you are the exclusive user of the phrase reefer madness, no strings attached. Uh, it is a mark that is connected to a product or service in the minds of your consumer. Um, and that is why a company name um, doesn't really by itself create you any sort of brand protection. You know, just because I am THC LLC doesn't mean that it stands for cannabis for me. It could stand for uh, terribly healthy chicken. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, acronyms or just any phrase at all doesn't necessarily mean that they're in the same industry as you or, or this providing the same products as you. So when you're, when you're talking about how do I develop reputation for my company, it's more than just choosing a company name. You not only need to have some phrase or image that you like, but you have to go out there and use it. And it's through that use that you create something that is protectable, licensable, um, because it creates some sort of commercial impression in the minds of your consumer. And when you've created that impression, that's when you can you know, use it as your own, license it to other companies to use, um, et cetera. So while you're out there um, not worried about temporary operators and starting to think about what your business is going to be, you know, the most important thing to do is create a product or service that people want to buy. And when they start buying that product or service, you're going to develop a reputation. And, and it's when you start attaching a name, a logo, a slogan to that reputation associated with the product or service is when you have a trademark and that is what's protectable. Mm -hmm. um, and if you get really good at it, some people might want to lease the right to use that from you and it's something that you can sell and you know, benefit from. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into the um, topics like that and others uh, over a series of shows that we're doing and uh, we look forward to uh, coming back to you next week for our next topic. So thank you for joining us this Friday afternoon. We look forward to seeing you next week. So for Travis Copenhaver, Nicholas Glendez, thanks so much. See you guys.